get to Fred, and Fred, it's all yours. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, somewhat like yesterday, we don't begin without a question to you all. So, how many of you have seen a 3D printer in operation? I don't mean like on TV, Big Bang Theory or something. Okay. How many of you have used a 3D printer? Okay. And how many of you have a 3D printer at your school? Okay. So, just about a lot. Okay. So, I don't have to explain uh, anything about how they work, but I will say that in general, there's a few different kinds of 3D printers. Um, the one at the top is MakerBot. They're, they're a very interesting thing if, if you've heard of them because 3D printers that started a lot like this uh, years ago, 1980s is when they began, and uh, at that time they were, as one would expect, several hundred thousand dollars. And then of course they've come down in price. And when they hit about the ten, twenty thousand dollar level, that's when a lot of uh, small uh, companies got their start, thinking that they could come back from the uh, underside that is use a lot of the technologies that were created and uh, make these low cost prints. And that's what started bringing this into education, just like writing on the coattails of. I don't know, Lotus 1, 2, 3, and Visical for spreadsheets. Uh, same thing with 3D printing. And so um, that was our first printer at the uh, University of Richmond. It took about 30 hours to build because it came in a kit. And uh, that, that, that was building and testing, I guess. But they basically did over a Thanksgiving uh, holiday. And so uh, it was pretty good. It printed only about four inches by four inches by four inches. Uh, to give you a sense of it, it was about $1,300 when we bought it. Um, there's lots of other printers out there. There's another kit, uh, RetWrap. It has a whole series of different kind of prep printers. It's an open source community uh, where they develop a lot of different uh, models and whatnot. And these uh, work on the same premise where, uh, I'll show you, that they kind of use this plastic filament to do it. And then uh, Z Corp 450, we bought, uh, that company, Z Corporation, uh, started with powder materials. And so a powder is put into a, uh, a bath and uh, one layer at a time. So a, very, a layer of very fine, in effect, high resolution powder across the bottom, but it's just a full sheet of it. And then it puts down binder or glue in very small droplets like an inkjet printer, only where you want the object to be. And then another layer of powder, so you start getting powder bound to powder where you want the object, but you also have this all this extra powder around it that you don't need. Uh, but the best, well, you do need it sort of, the machine does, because it, it allows you to be able to ha uh, fill up the volume with powder and then on top of it have something else that's printed. So it, it adds support. Imagine like a scaffold for a bridge as it's uh, being built, or uh, the old days of sort of an arch. Before you get the keystone in, you have that scaffold to help support all the blocks as they're getting closer and closer together. So uh, the, the best part about this kind of printer uh, is that along with the binder, you can deliver some ink. In fact, it, ours uses uh, HP ink cartridges. In fact, 50, HP 57, if you're familiar with that one. Um, just normal ink, it can do full color, and so you can get full color objects out of that. And then lastly, um, this was a Kickstarter. Uh, this was... Uh, the first 3D printer uh, on the, that, that had actually become number one on the technology side of Kickstarter for uh, money raised um, above their, uh, what they're asking for. Um, it works uh, through a, a liquid acrylic uh, material. It's liquid and there's, a, in, in this case, a, a laser that comes up from the bottom or optical. Somehow there's a beam of light that comes up where you want the object to be and the, the light causes hardening, curing of that liquid until it becomes solid. And, uh, and so that's just a whole other method of doing this. <clears throat> so at, at Richmond, we basically have uh, this kind of printer and we just got this kind of printer. So start off from there. This is the room where we uh, have this. I mentioned Technology Learning Center yesterday in the digital storytelling talk. Uh, along with our five editing suites, there's another room off to the side um, I mentioned you, you were quite familiar. Yeah, 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 I know that. It looks a whole lot different, probably. Yeah, it does. Um, so normally in the front, there um, have been a studio of sorts for uh, video and portraits uh, being done, and then a lot of storage and a lot of camera equipment. And although we still uh, intend to have that as a function, um, we have these 3D printers and this large table in the middle. Uh, 
that, that are starting to incorporate uh, what might be a little bit of a maker space, uh, but we're not necessarily uh, having that as our original intention. So um, we have a 3D printer right there, uh, a different company called Solid Dual. They make these great printers that are, uh, this one is uh, $600, comes with a shell, and there's a larger one here uh, that is about $800, and they print eight inches by eight inches by eight inches, much larger object. Um, and we just printed the largest thing we ever had, which was a jack-o'-lantern for, for uh, Halloween. I, I, I wish I could say it was an academic thing, but um, anyhow, it's, it's visual and inspirational, I guess, to some degree. And then there's, the, uh, there's that Z-Corp color printer in the back, along with the finishing station for it. So the idea was not to start off with this as a necessarily a proof of concept printer, but that's what it became for us because uh, these printers were not very expensive, relatively speaking, and it provided enough impetus and interest of getting people thinking about, well, what could be done? Uh, so, some of the hardest questions are, well, what would you do with a 3D printer? What would you make? What would you create? And so as we're printing all these, you know, some of these kind of games and toys and things like that, uh, we're using those to try to get people uh, an opportunity to see what the technology can bring. We don't want it to drive teaching and learning, but we want to help it foster the idea of what uh, is possible. Okay. Yes? What's the purpose of the camera there? Is that just so you can see when the job is completed? Um, yes and no. Um, where's, where's yeah, so we can, we can, so there's a webcam right in the front, right here. Okay. It's just a Logitech webcam. It's sitting on a 3D printed kind of pole that we have. Um, we actually have a website, blog.richmond.edu slash ti3d for thinking in 3D. I have a few business cards up here um, to, I guess, share. Um, but the whole idea is that uh, we have some information about the uh, 3D printers and 3D design. The idea is that is an entry into thinking about 3D visualization. Uh, and of course, that we're coming at it from sort of both sides. There's one side from the disciplines where they're showing much, much uh, more complex kind of information in classes. And we're coming at it from this direction that talks about 3D design and visual elements uh, that hopefully combine in a multimodal kind of uh, uh, sort of platform within uh, people's minds. So um, with that webcam actually shoots a, a picture every minute or so and sends it to our blog site. And, uh, and right now we finish a print job and it's, I, I ask them to just leave it alone <laughs> until I get back and the job, or at least until the end of this morning um, to take a look. So if you happen to go to the website blog.richmond.edu slash ti3d um, on the front page, there's a link that says, what's printing now? And I'll click on what's printing now. And normally it has a few different cameras on it, but only one is operational right now. And it's showing this printer, and it's printing, or had printed, uh, two art students' projects, which I'll describe. So that's what the webcam is for. It's also, in, in effect, people cannot see, uh, can see their projects as they're printing out. Some of these jobs, uh, the biggest one we've had took 50 hours. So over a span of, uh, some of them are like two hours, three hours. So it gives people an idea uh, what is actually happening. It also gives us an opportunity to take a look at it once in a while to make sure that the printing is going okay. These are not 100% uh, uh, reliable printers. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we augmented our printing with that Z-Core printer. That, that Z-Core printer, um, it's $40,000. So it was, uh, we had put in a couple grants, um, proposals, and uh, eventually uh, we got the, the one that we currently have. Uh, so uh, that one is meant to be much more reliable. Our student staff can operate that in a more reliable fashion uh, to be able to meet more sort of production service kind of needs. Uh, but still, it's meant not to be a Kinko's. It's meant to be an opportunity where <laughs> students come in and kind of say, you yeah, know, let's Let's collaborate, let's consult on, on, on you know, how to uh, do this design thing, how to uh, get your object into a fashion that, that is printable, and then you know, here's the printer for you to operate. So, so at $40,000, what's your space? What's your eight by Field eight? Volume? Actually, strangely enough, only two inches more on one side than that. So that one is eight by eight by eight. The other one can do eight by 10 by eight. Okay. So and it doesn't buy a lot more. And still what, just one material? Uh, one material, but it's full color. Okay. Yep. So what you get out of it is a very weak 
powder uh, glued material um, that's color and then you have to finish it. We usually don't, there's three different methods of doing it, but one is to dunk it into the, like a super glue bath. And uh, once you dunk it, the super glue infiltrates all the little nooks and crannies, if you will, and then it hardens as you, you know, pull it out. And, uh, and, and then you get a fairly durable thing. It's still somewhat brittle relative to something that you'd have made out of plastic. And this is still brittle compared to what you would have if you went to a factory and they, they built you a you know, several thousand dollar mold for plastic injection molding. So if you're printing thousands of a part, this is not for you. However, if you're printing something uh, like a Hilbert's cube, and you're probably only gonna have one faculty or student, you know, one class interested in this, you're not gonna pay $5,000 to get this uh, mold made and printed. So instead, uh, we can do it because um, th this whole area came from rapid prototyping. So how does it work? So, so most of you kind of know, but for those of you who don't, basically this particular printer works a lot like a hot glue gun. Um, so uh, instead of a glue stick, you have plastic filament. It's, it's on a spool like weed trimmer cord. I mean, it looks a lot like weed trimmer cord. Uh, and then it goes into the machine. And instead of pulling a trigger, uh, you have a, an extruder motor that has teeth on it. And the teeth grip your plastic and pull it down into the printer. And then it heats up at the end, just like you do at the uh, working end of a hot glue gun. At that point, it gets to about 200 Celsius, uh, 430 Fahrenheit, and uh, it, it melts at that point. And, and it's, we, we actually don't want truly liquidy because it, it, that just kind of oozes everywhere and it becomes a mess. You want just at the point where it's uh, liquid enough that it will uh, yeah, extrude and will actually bind to the layer below it or the surface of the printer, uh, the print bed. And the print bed is also about 100 Celsius, so it's boiling water temperature uh, that allows it to be sticky enough for the plastic that is being deposited onto. Otherwise, plastic and plaster, plastic and aluminum don't really stick to each other. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of interesting areas, which I'll get into, but sort of materials chemistry, that there's a lot of interesting science in this as well. And so the, the smart part about it is that the computer controls it and uh, prints one layer at a time. You can imagine it's sort of like if it's moving in just one direction, you're laying down a bead of plastic like caulking. And it's just going, it's going to stop and start wherever you want the object to be. This is just showing you if you're printing something solid. And so it just does rows. And then the whole thing lowers slightly and does the next layer and the next layer above that. And you build up your whole object. So it's more of a fabrication than printing, but it is additive. You're adding it just like toner or ink. Uh, and then this is something I did for an edge cause talk um, uh, November before uh, this last uh, 20, so uh, edge 2012. And so this was showing you in SketchUp. This was just a little coin that we made to get people a sense of, uh, of you know, what can be done, give them a token to now say that this was, uh, when we printed about this thing, I think there was one on one of your tables, uh, it's about 12 cents of plastic that you're holding. And uh, the CTLT things, please feel free to keep those. Um, that's a little bit more, I think about 14 cents of plastic uh, to, to make those. So just to give you a ballpark, if you haven't been doing this kind of stuff. Uh, different printing software uses uh, different ways to actually do it. Um, this is part of getting into the visual spatial, the, the whole title of the talk, but uh, giving opportunity for people to kind of see, even once you've designed something, how do you actually go about uh, getting it into a, uh, a platform prepared for printing? And we have students do this. Uh, let's see. Um, Oh, this just talks about slicing, I guess. So the software, we don't have to do the, uh, the heavy lifting, if you will, to actually tell the printer what to do. Um, the whole idea is you have, you have a design, and if that design is, quote, printable, there's, it's called watertight. If, if there aren't any holes and gaps in the uh, structure, you can put it into the printing software. And it does this, this heavy lifting of actually calculating based upon if, you're, if you gave it a design where you're trying to do like a dome, it's going to approximate that with the layers of plastic uh, to be able to reproduce that object. Um, there's the actual code that it sends to the printer. Um, computer science uh, since would love uh, some aspects of this. So uh, some of the molecules that we've printed um, have more lines of code in them than it takes to fly a Boeing 777. 
So it was like three and a half million lines for the uh, flight controls on the Boeing Triple Seven and, and uh, all the avionics and everything. And it's like five and a half uh, million for uh, a particular protein that we had printed. And so it's uh, pretty interesting stuff. And the algorithms and, and the, the high parametric aspects of uh, the software, um, computer science students just love that. And, and, and it goes into the math as well, of course. Um, there was a video of the printer printing, but um, it's not that big a deal. Um, so here's some of the connections that we make where you're not necessarily looking at a particular discipline. Uh, so some of the things we think about. So visual, spatial, which I'll show a few more things about. Uh, tactile learning, you don't necessarily see that quite often in liberal arts. We think oh, oftentimes uh, theoretical and conceptual and not necessarily uh, almost vocational, at least as you might think about actually doing the printing. Um, the uh, other is intellectual property. This is really hot right now. So uh, what happens when uh, there are websites like Thingiverse on um, good side where people can uh, submit their designs freely shareable, but what happens if you scan, 3D scan that Nike shoe and you're able to 3D print it? What does that do? You know, so of course trademarks and infringement and copyright and you know, the whole fashion industry partly relies and partly abhors uh, copying all that. So what does this do? Um, we have to have a law school, so, so this becomes fodder. Uh, it's great for that. Um, ethics. So, um, of course, people have heard of the 3D printed gun, probably. So there was the 007 Goldfinger. I imagine the next movie might have a 3D printed weapon of some kind. So if, if, if I did, if you see that movie and it turns out to say, like, right, it was right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there are 3D printed guns. And so there are undetectable guns, or close to undetectable guns. So. You know, that, that brings in a whole other aspect. And it's not the only tool. There's a lot of to other tools that we have uh, around the university that are deadly, both intentional or not, but uh, you know, just go to the science building. Um, but but uh, anyhow, th this kind of brings that into it to some degree. Um, design can be, can be a great uh, aspect of, of learning, which will be part of the next few minutes of my talk. And then mechanical learning. Um, Putting a printer together or uh, continual operation of it. The students that we have that work in the TLC, uh, they get a lot of uh, uh, additional skills that they've learned from going through that experience. And that itself is a, an informal education, uh, at least if you think of Dewey. And so uh, mechanical learning is part of that, at least the way we operate it. So what we've done in classes, so this was the first class that we did uh, formal integration of 3D printing. It was a 3D design course, and this was a traditional one in which students would often use foam core if they're actually uh, going to make objects and you know, basic sculpture and uh, wooden blocks and things like that. And uh, they had never used computers in, a, in that course at all. And so the idea was, well, if one's working on a much larger project, you might not need to start thinking of working with or uh, you know, graphical designer or more importantly a, an engineer because in some of the cases of you know, some of this big steel art that you see outside of a lot of places, you can't, those you can't just finagle with a plasma torch in, in your studio. Some of those you, you really have to plan it out. They weigh lots of, uh, you know, they, they weigh a lot. Uh, they're you know difficult you know the materials and all that. So the idea of giving the students an opportunity to start seeing some of this kind of stuff um, was great. So uh, what they actually do is uh, th this is very basic. The first kind of project in the course, uh, computer assisted, it, it ends up looking a little bit like a Rubik's cube. The idea is that you've got about 27 uh, smaller cubes that comprise of three by three by three. Uh, sets of smaller cubes that comprise what looks like a puzzle when it's done. But they get to choose th three sort of mega pieces of these cubes that need to fit together. And they do this in Google SketchUp. So it's a fairly low learning curve tool, but it gets them seeing uh, on the computer um, 3D visualization. They have to take measurements. These things have to fit together. There's a lot of good, interesting things uh, for doing that. Um, the next class, we just did this. Uh, they were just in the lab using this uh, two weeks ago, and so you might have interest in that, I guess. It, um, integrated Quantitative Science course. We have uh, an HHMI grant, large one, for uh, integrating the discipline, so there are course options that students can take if they will eventually major in uh, science or interested in science disciplines. And in this course, they, it is co-taught by a chemist, biologist, um, 
computer scientist, mathematician, physicist. Uh, and, and, and there's been some rotation and some special guest lectures and that kind of thing. But basically the single course is taught in such a way that it, it creates that flow between all those disciplines and can be a, a pretty interesting course. Well, they came to us saying, we'd like to do a new experiment with the students. And, uh, and this is something that we can't buy. We haven't been able to find a scientific supply company or whatever that actually does this. Um, they're wanting to do fruit flies and be able to uh, watch them as they, as they walk through, or crawl through um, a, a place where they can video record this and then do their uh, motion analysis, physiological analysis of, of their pathways. Their um, fruit flies are drosophilia, there are drosophilia activity monitors, dams that you can buy, but they allow them to fly around and stuff. And in a lot of the cases, they're using young enough uh, fruit flies that they're not flying yet. So you know, the idea of having something like that doesn't work. So we worked uh, back and forth uh, between the TLC, myself, and the faculty. Uh, we went through a few iterations. What you see here was our first imaginings, or our second imaginings of a design. We were thinking of a racetrack, so we were kind of doing the thistle downs, uh, kind of the um, Kentucky Derby uh, kind of approach. Well, thinking that, so they always typically crawl upwards, uh, so uh, they get to the top and then you can turn the whole thing uh, on the, you know, confusion all that, but turn it over and do the next trial. Uh, and this was a, you know, just a webcam pointed at it. But then we went through it and we, we then decided, well, it's probably not best because of path lengths and all that, and so we would just do it this way. And then in the end, uh, they decided, well, let's just try this out. And so our first prototype, we put some fruit flies in, they dose them with carbon dioxide, sleep them and all that, and then they put them in and they wake up and, where am I? And, uh, <laughs> There's no fruit anymore, or I don't know. So, um, so we ended up something like an hourglass, so it tips over, and there's, there it is on the front table, so the working uh, thing. Um, so there it is. No, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah. It is, it's sort of the, the, the geek will take it to the extreme, you yeah. know. Yeah, I, I could have gone to white pages at one time when I had them, uh, and so I started going to the website for, you know, 411 kind of stuff. Um, no, we, we do have some sense of practicality. So this is a, just a piece of plexiglass, but we did uh, embed some uh, uh, neodymium magnets on them, and then 3D printed caps. Uh, that was probably even too far. We probably didn't need to do that. But anyhow, well, yeah, that's a little bit of geekiness. But, uh, but anyhow, so here's the object and with the tracks on them, and so there's magnets that are embedded in the plastic, and the students will just put the flies in, do this kind of thing. Um, it's actually translucent enough it's kind of dark in here. <laughs> no light. Um, so you put on the back back light on it, and then you can have a high def camera recording them, and then they can, of course, do their analysis looking at the videos, and they can actually look at joints moving. You know, really slow it down that kind of stuff. So, uh, so you know, one of the things in this course that they were most excited about was the iterative improvement of that design. So the, the students are thinking about how do, how can we improve that, and that's of course part of their their experiment. So that was just happening this uh, semester. These are some students who had gotten an internal uh, student grant for getting their own 3D printer. Uh, they're psychology students and they're making uh, stimuli that they, you know, so a lot of uh, experiments will be done, especially in development, uh, where you know, you're combining off the shelf uh, stimulus uh, for, for the uh, subjects. And instead, they can 3D print their own and so they have exact um, uh, uh, control over what that stimulus is going to look like and what the subjects that are going to be looking at it are able to use. So, I'm not sure if I, so there they are again. So, visual spatial. So this was some work I did in my research years and years ago. Uh, these are water clusters. You might be able to see sort of, there's a hydrogen and oxygen, there's a hydrogen there. And so there's a water molecule and there's eight water molecules and they're uh, hydrogen bonded to each other it's frozen in a cluster. We would do it in an experiment where it goes into a high vacuum and all that. Um, there's actually two different structures here, and uh, they're slightly different. They have a, a slightly different symmetry to them. Um, this was the first known uh, instance where we could actually see in a uh, ultra cold, near absolute zero environment, uh, two of the exact same uh, cluster. Uh, with different symmetries, and so it's a real interesting, we call them molecular ice cubes in, in science, uh, but nonetheless, of the science journal magazine. So anyhow, um, if, you, if you had this in a computer and if you knew how to look at what you're seeing, 
You would have to have two open and you'd have to try to look at the two together. But if we have this 3D printed, you can actually give it to the students and then they can actually sit with the two and compare and contrast all that kind of stuff and start looking at where these inner planes are. This can be done with ball and stick models. If you've taken chemistry, you probably had to do those kinds of things, those darn things, they never stick in and all that kind of stuff. But you know, you're talking about, in this case, 24 atoms and lots and lots of bonds. It would be painful to actually do that. And you might have to start stealing, to start creatively obtaining some sticks from your neighbor. So <laughs> how can you necessarily do that? And then here's one more example, if that isn't enough. So um, this, is, uh, this doesn't look like a song. Um, so Andy McGraw in our music department, um, uh, very innovative guy, very tech savvy. Um, he, he's into micro timing he, um, of, of music, uh, very much thinking about sort of the beats and, and, uh, and how there is uh, some um, periodicity, there, there, there are some interesting things that, that are done in performance of music uh, that you can notice that certain cultures, certain um, artists will uh, slowly proceed, all of, they'll, they'll have their actual playing of what would be, let's say, the one beat, slightly earlier, slightly later, and, and of course, different genres of music kind of uh, exaggerate that to actually form the little sort of the, the kind of music it is. And so in his case, he wants students to be able to see these kind of things. And in an introductory course, um, they would not necessarily be exposed to this uh, level of detail in music at all. But his thought was, if I could visually represent this, and he actually went to the extreme, he said, well, what would it take to actually do this? And we were, I was throwing out, strangely enough, um, uh, I was saying like MathCAD, Mathematica, the, you know, software that is, is pretty high learning curve for mathematicians, let alone um, anyone in the arts. And, uh, but he picked it up. And what he did was, um, he had instruments built with an electrical engineer that actually had little pickups, like you would have with an electric guitar, um, that actually senses when, let's say, percussion instrument is played, or when uh, the um, different uh, um, valves are played on a brass instrument, or uh, a gamelan, you know, gong sounds, or things like that. And so um, his interest is, is in uh, Bali music, and, and so he went around with these instruments and uh, had, uh, in different villages, uh, people would perform fierce music, and this is one of their uh, traditional songs. And uh, he then, that data was then recorded in the computer, and then he put it in Mathematica, and then uh, showed it here. And it's hard to actually see, but this is what we were able to print on our first 3D printer. Um, this is a representation, at least in the computer, of what we'll print on our new uh, printer, because these are, uh, the color is kind of denoting hot spots, if you will, sort of very small aspects of the uh, surface of the music. And what actually happened is, so at one end, uh, you've got the start of the song, at the other end, it's the end of the song and the uh, wideness of the tube, if you will. Think of like, uh, think of, uh, was it, who, who actually, uh, was that Edison? Who, who had the uh, early recording device where it was like on a wax cylinder? Um, I'm, think of it like that. So as, as the song progresses, you're going upwards through the, the piece. Um, when it's wider, it's at a faster part of the music. Um, so it's at the end, um, this, it's trying to kind of equilibrate uh, Bali and Western music uh, to some degree, but what you can think of a, a measure is one circle, uh, one rotation around this. And so, uh, because of the way in which they play these instruments uh, and, and their songs, you actually get some artifacts like here and here uh, through music, and the whole shape of it is going to be respective of that instrument at that performance of that music. And so um, the idea is you could have cylinders for different instruments in different villages and use those to compare and contrast. Now for his research, he's going to be doing the full bore thing in Mathematica, but for the students, it's going to be awesome for them to be able to compare and contrast music for, let's say, uh, you know, classical, operatic, and jazz, and who knows, a whole bunch of different uh, music by having this kind of thing uh, that we couldn't do uh, because we're not going to get a factory to build these things. Um, so anyhow, um, the next thing is sort of molecules. So um, I, well, I did the water molecule. Back there is, is a protein. It's, it, there's four of them that kind of sit together uh, that form an ion channel. Uh, if you didn't have these in you, you wouldn't have a heartbeat. This, this allows potassium ions uh, to go through cell membranes. Well, it controls them. It regulates that. Um, this is the work of one of our biologists. And so in this case, 
uh, it's again an instructional material. We're not expecting that the students are going to be building these, um, but they're going to be using this to help learn how to do it. And it can be introduced in a class where you're not going to have students doing high protein work in some of the more sophisticated software, or at least not initially. And it, even if you do, uh, you can first introduce this to them where it's a, almost like a puzzle, how the pieces form together if you take a look at it later. Um, and then, then introduce them to the computer and then kind of and then you can sit with the two, the computer and this, next to each other and see how that works. And so those are some of the experiments that we're going to be uh, conducting to really start talking seriously, more seriously, about how 3D printing can affect uh, digital spatial learning, which I should have said at the very beginning is one of the highest predictors of success at least in introductory science courses. Later on, mathematics uh, aptitude takes over, but early on, a lot of it is visual spatial because they're continually you know, trying to teach you all these different molecules and ionics and, and covalent bonding and atomic orbitals and things like that. And what do we do when we're trying to do this kind of visual representation? This is a pretty good, and it's a nice AMA gift, so um, you can say, wow, that, that's not bad. Um, what you have there is uh, DNA, and then you've got a probe molecule, uh, which um, was designed, in, in effect, uh, to try to uh, interrogate some things. And so if you're going to go ahead and do this, and if you're going to be showing what this means, perhaps having the physical representation is going to be good for being able to get to have the details that, although this is a little bit of a cartoon, um, it's a cartoon of reality and the 3D printing, will be a slightly uh, different kind of cartoon, but you can actually see more closely how it's actually rotating around and getting into the molecule because or around the DNA, um, almost like a snake. You won't necessarily get that if uh, you're just looking at this attempted 3D visualization. Um, so uh, that's really it for the, the presented stuff. I do have data and all that kind of stuff, but um, what kind of things would you print? Or have you printed? For those of you who raise your hand as in you've operated or have through the printers. I know we haven't, I don't think we've done this yet, but um, one of the faculty members who wrote a grant to get 3D printers in our theater department and does set design. And so having her students do, take their CAD designs and <coughs> small scale models of, of sets. Yeah, yeah we have, uh, for us, it's the, specifically the, the, their black box theater that they're interested in. So we uh, start constructing sort of the outer part, but it's a little bit hard because the scale doesn't work quite as well. But the actual uh, props and furniture and stuff, it's great for absolutely, and, and it can be much faster because you can you don't have to use the computer, and, and they don't necessarily have to learn vector works, which is used in other courses. Yeah. Did Did you say already how the projects have to be approved? How do we oh, how do we operate this? it and all that kind of stuff? All I mean, practical. briefly, you know, like um, uh, everybody says, did you proof before you printed your paper? Like, we know this from the time you're in elementary school. Sure. But, like, yeah. but, so before you hit print. It's a little <laughs> bit like the way we handle poster printing is people sign up for an appointment with a student uh, staffer in the lab where they have the poster printer and same thing with a 3D printer. And the anticipation is during that initial thing, it's a consultation. Um, and they can take the model through additional software that the designer might not have access to uh, to kind of see whether it's going to print or not. So you always have that consultation. Yes, that absolutely. And then that's that's one of the biggest things that will keep it from becoming a Kinko's. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, you can still have the same thing at Kinko's, but typically they'll just you know, but, whip but up real fast. But it's a service. At this point, no, you don't have to pay or does the department pay? How much does yes. it? You we, say we don't charge. We don't classes. charge for an individual. So, um, for that experiment, for the IQS class, we had to print 10 of them. So we charged them for the, the nine, I guess, but typically we consider any first print an academic thing. So we don't charge for posters either. You know, the three by five foot academic posters, we don't charge for those. Not yet. We charge a penny a minute. Because uh, for 3D printing, because we wanted to do something to prevent the silly stuff, but not make it all, all I care about is being able to replace the filament, you know, I don't, you know. So we came up to this number of a penny a minute. So, you know, if you go 120 minutes, a two-hour print, 
you're only talking about a dollar twenty, mm -hmm. and and they can put it on there. We 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 have a printing, right. you know, they have a printing amount, right. and they can put it onto their to their actual account. So you know, it's it's not really prohibitive in any way. And do you have a consultation the same? Similar to Richmond? We, um, I was going to ask Fred how they did this. We, um, we have a help desk technician who, who is our 3D guy, um, and he does courses for students. So he'll put on a one hour course for any student who signs up and sort of basically show them how to use the 3D printer. And then their name gets on an approved list. And then when they come to print, the students at the help desk will actually give them access to the materials, to the plastic, and then they can go ahead and print because they had this training. So you really train the TLC students, and then do they, tr do they train other students, or do only the TLC students actually physically use the printer? They let people like students drive. Uh, but then they don't let the students take over the driving and it's scary, you know. Uh, but yeah, that, that would be the next step that we would like to do as we mature a little bit in what are the routine maintenance kind of things that, that we don't anticipate because we make some mistakes ourselves, but we don't necessarily imagine that we make every possible mistake. And, uh, and I actually was initiating this as a pet project of mine initially, and so uh, it kind of bore from me. And so we have uh, the sciences and structural technologists is the other person who's kind of the expert. And so uh, we do it completely within the, our center uh, for operations. And so we, we do internal support and you know, self-sufficient to that. So how do you do it at Hendrix? Um, right now, it's, we have a 3D printer in the physics lab. And the physics lab manager is in charge of it. And I don't think it's open yet to the general student body, and we're thinking about getting another 3D printer and putting it in our media center area for general student use. I'll tell you one funny thing that we found is um, our, our help desk guy teamed up with one of our art faculty, and the two of them sort of made the, dis they looked at all the choices and made the decision as to what to buy. And my only thing about it was that it has to live in the Center for Creativity so that it is available to any student who wants to use it. I'm really, this is a liberal arts institution and everybody should be able to have access to it. And this art faculty member, when he found that out, he removed himself from the process. He was just like, no, no, only my students should be able to get access to it. And I was like, no, no, this is my dollar. <laughs> this is college dollars, the entire student body. And he has literally removed himself from it. So other faculty in his department are now having their students use it. But our sculptor, who was the one who wanted it, was just like, no, I'm not, I'm not having my students use it then. So there, you know, faculty can be very protective about their technologies, and when you kind of tell them they're not special, they're not real happy. And this is one of the great guys in our college. You know, I mean, he's a great guy, and he's young, so you wouldn't expect him to be curmudgeonly, you know? I mean, he's a great, great guy. But about this particular technology, he became very possessive. So he's so, trying to buy his own now? I think that's what he's trying to figure out, you know, which again, at a school our size is just silly. Right. You know, I mean, it would be far better if we're going to buy a second one to do something that can do a different material or, you know, to do something of a different variety that, again, everyone could take advantage of. So. You know, our experience is like, we have, a, we have a 3D printer as well, so it's basically open to anybody. Uh, we'll take... Kind of, we'll take some things from Thinglers if they have, uh, they have to design something themselves, but uh, the idea is to get the word out, and then once that word out, then we might come into an issue where, okay, no more funny things to print. Uh, but currently, we don't have any restrictions as far as time limit, uh, cost, things of that sort. Uh, but 
just recently, this past summer, we had a group of autistic students come in, and uh, we gave them basically a tutorial on how to do things like that. And so we used Tinkercad for them, uh, and they were able to print keychains very similar to this. And like the experience is, is really like is really encouraging and really inspiring. Uh, just to see them actually print it, but also see the ability of so many uh, just to kind of be creative whenever they can uh, in a split second. This tutorial was maybe about an hour. They were able, they were able to crank out some kind of cool stuff. Uh, granted, a couple of them, when they printed, obviously it wasn't on the platform, things didn't print normally. Uh, but the idea of the learning is, is there, okay, we go back to the drawing board and we figure out what we did wrong. So that was kind of cool. I was really interested. We have uh, two 3D scanners. So I was really interested as far as if you look into 3D scanning, uh, if which ones you are going to go for, or things like that. Sure, we have just the cheap X engine. It's a three thousand dollar one. Is, is that one of the ones you? Have? We have that one. We just got the the MakerBot three D. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't too interested in that one because it's really uh, localized to a small thing. I mean, so is the next engine, but you can scale it out right. with with the right software and everything. So. Yeah. The cool project we had um, with three D scanner and three D printer is uh, one of our anthropology professors. She had a bunch of old bones that were kind of in her closet, and I guess she was going to give them off to a, a university. She's cleaning out her closet. So, like, she was going to donate them to another university, and so she wanted these replicas before she gave them away and never got them back. So, we went through a process of, uh, I think they were like monkey kneecaps or something. And so, we went through a process of.